Remember last time we took the code that was, we had, we had just one big class that like did everything, okay? And um, it did the calculation. And the problem with that is that we wouldn't have to run this standalone app every time we wanted to do this calculation, right? We wanted to be able to, we wanted the potential to be able to do this calculation from a number of different places, all right? So we want a component for it, in other words. And component means creating a class. A little bit of terminology here, a class versus an object. Um, anyone care to define what a class versus an object is? Use a class to make the object. That's, that's very true. Anyone want to add to that? Class is a template. All right. Does anyone want an object is an instance of the class? All these things are absolutely right on the mark. All right. An object is a generic description of some kind of thing, some type of thing. All right. And an object is one specific instance of it. So I could talk about book, all right? What do books have? Books have number of pages. Books have an author. Books have a publisher. Books have a type of binding. Um, books have a language or multiple languages, and so on down the line. All these are characteristics of the idea of a book, the template for a book. Now, this particular book would be an object. All right, because it has a specific exact number of pages. It has a specific exact title. It has specific authors and so on. So you think of when you're divide, defining a component, you're, you're defining a component that can stand in for any member of that class. All right. So in the case of our tip, like I said before, we could potentially, if you had separate checks at a restaurant, there could be four tip objects. One tip class, right, because each meal is its own instance of it, um, but what makes up a tip is the same, all right, for all four people, but there could be four unique instances of it, one for person A, one for person B, one for person C, and so on. So we define the characteristics. We define the characteristics and the behaviors and put that in a class. We use that class then to create specific instances and then set the different parameters and call the different functions and get different values. So let's look where we left off last time. And we talked about how we're kind of going to do, kind of going to have two different kinds of classes as we go forward. We're going to have the class that contains the main. All right. And I called it unit test because effectively that's what this is going to do. No one is going to write a class that simply calculates the, uh, or, or write an application that calculates a tip for uh, a meal that costs $63. All right. No one's ever going to write an app to do that other than to demonstrate. What would people do, though? Well, people might write an app where the tip is connected to a GUI. So that as you type in the amount of the bill and as you click the, the button that says what kind of service you get, then that class creates an instance of it, an object, and does the math and does the calculation. All right. Unfortunately, GUIs in Java are a little complicated, especially when we're going to take the old school, we're going to write these things by hand approach. All right. Therefore, GUIs aren't covered until later on in the semester. So what are we doing? Well, we want to learn about building classes. We want to learn about creating these business logic classes. So we're going to do that, and so we have to find a way to make them work. How do we make them work? Well, we are going to have test code. So here's an example of a test code. This is going to test the tip class. Remember, what's the difference between unit testing and system testing? Unit testing tests one component, 
and then system testing tests to make sure everything works together. For example, if this was really an application for a restaurant, then maybe there'd be a meal class as well, and all sorts of other classes, a, a, uh, a menu class, a entree class, an appetizer class. There might be all these different classes if, there were, uh, if we were going to integrate this into a real application. We can test each of the classes individually to make sure they do their job. All right. Then we test everything together, and that is the system test. So effectively what we're doing, what we're going to do for our first several programs is we're going to make some classes and then unit test them. And right here is the code to unit test my tip calculator class. All right. Here is my tip calculator class. It has one method, double hard cost. And it takes the cost, multiplies it by 15%, and returns the answer. So it takes an argument, multiplies it, and gives an answer. Now, see, here's the thing of a component. It doesn't care where that cost came from. That cost could come from another object. That cost could come from something that the person enters in in the GUI. That cost could be generated as a random number or generated by a for loop or whatever. This function doesn't care where that value comes from. To use this, uh, this, uh, this class and this method, you simply need to give it a value. Likewise, this class doesn't care what you do with the result. You could, for example, add the result to a total and not even show the amount of the tip, but just show the total amount due. Or you could itemize it and say, this is the value of the meal, this is the value for the tip, here's the total. So what, what is done with the return value is also irrelevant from this class's perspective. Its job is simply to take the inputs it needs, to do its thing, and to return an answer. All right? Here's our test code, and right now our test code is simply, and let me clean up some of these commented out codes for this example. We simply take $63, do our tip calculation, and display the result. Now I can go and compile this and run it, and I hope it still works like it did on Monday. So I'm in the lab instructor folder, my user folder. I need to go down to the desktop. I'm there. And I need to compile. Actually, if I compile the unit test Java, it will actually produce the class file for both of them. Because this unit test class references a tip calculator if the tip calculator needs to be generated, it will generate it. All right. And now I can run it. And it shows me what the answer is, $9.45. Now, this wouldn't be adequate to test my application, right? I mean, I could, I could have a random number generator in the tip calculator, and it's just generating some number. Or I could always be returning $9.45 no matter what the bill is, right? So I don't want to test it with just one value. I could go in, I could do a couple things. I could go in and, um, what do I want to say? Change the hard-coded number and try it for um, $48 and get the result. All right, and see if that's correct, and so on and so forth. Or I could go and generate a number randomly and test it for that. All right. Um, or I could loop through um, the values 1 to 100 and make sure it did the calculation. Or I could loop through the elements of an array. 
maybe there were certain specific values that I'm looking for. Again, in this case, it's not really that um, critical, shall we say, because everyone's getting 15%. It's not like, like, for example, one of the things that we often do in many of these classes is we do the uh, tuition calculation, where there's a different rate if you take up to 12 credit hours and 13 through 18 is charged a different way and, eight, and 19 and up is charged a different way. So in there, there would be specific values you would want to test. You'd want to make sure 12 and 13 worked, right? Because that's right on the border of the calculation. You don't really have that here, but in case you did, you could build an array of the things that you want to test and loop through them. Now here's a nice thing. Most classes that you get aren't going to be as straightforward as this. All right? But once you write a little test class for your um, class, your unit test class, as you make changes, you can run the test again and make sure you still get the right answer. All right? So let's go in and let's change this to, instead of using $63, use a random number. And how would I do that? Random times what? Well, I don't know. What would be reasonable for a meal? If this is me, it would be times $5, let's say. But let's imagine that you're a little more of a big spender than me. So let's go all the way. Let's, let's randomly generate a value between 0 and $200. I'm going to save that. Let me compile it. All right. And now I can run it. The bill is 154. The tip is 23. We should take our calculator out. I would assume that's 15%. The bill is that. Run it again. Oops. All right. 127. $19, $8, and so on. So I could go and make sure those are correct. All right? That would sort of get tedious after a while, right? Especially if I had to do a lot of tests. So one thing I could do is I could put it in a loop. All right? So if you've had C sharp and you've done four loops in C sharp, you understand the way they work. If not, we'll, we'll review those. Let me go in here, and I can put this code in a for loop. For. I'm going to do this and run it, and then we'll talk about the details of how this works. I always like to make sure it works first because it's kind of dumb for me to explain to you why this code is this way and then realize that the code, in fact, doesn't work. All right, then I have to go back and, and, and fix it. So, all right, here we have this where it is going in and it is 10 times through it's going to generate a random number, do the tip calculation, and display the results. So there we go. The bill is 107, tip is 16, total is 123, and so on down the line. We could do something like this. We would want to put a blank line between them kind of neaten the output a little bit. Repeat, please. Yeah, we probably should. Um, I, I, th I think I have bigger fish to fry today, though. All right, so that's a good thought. 
and, and we can talk about how to do that. But for now, I, I guess I'm not that worried about it. There we can see there's a row of asterisks between each one. And we would take our calculator out and, and, and verify that it's correct. Um, one thing to keep in mind is, remember, this is a test class. Its sole purpose is to make sure our business logic class is working. All right? So I'm not, how do I want to put this? I'm not terribly concerned that this is a masterpiece of coding. All right? Because this is kind of throwaway code anyhow. All right? Now, in this class, you're not going to throw it away. You know, you can't say it was throwaway code, so I threw it away. No. You need to write this. And you need to write it to thoroughly test your object. So if there's multiple possibilities for things, you need to test as thoroughly as you possibly can. And we'll talk about that in a second, where we were going to add a level of service here. All right? We're going to add a level of service um, uh, to this and do that. Let's make one more change here. Let's say I'm interested in certain specific values. This is get generating a random number, right? But let's say I'm interested in, you know, $10, $20, $30, $40, all right? I could do that one of two ways, all right? Let's, let's put our thinking hats on today. I could do that one of two ways if I was interested specifically in this example of 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. What's one way that I could do it? Yes. Yeah. I could change my loop to say, I, exactly. I is uh, equal to uh, 10 initially. I is less than 100. And then I could say i equals i plus 10. And the way this loop works, again, to review, is the first time through the loop, it sets the variable at this value. As long as this condition is true, it's going to repeat the body of the loop. And each time through the loop, we do this expression. So we add 10 to the value of i. So let's go and save this. Oh, and. When they do a tip calculation, I'm going to do the tip calculation for I. Give me a compiler, though. Did I forget to save it? All right, I don't need a semicolon after that. All right. I bet I forgot to save it. Oh, I know what it's doing. I need to do this. It was doing the calculation based on it was doing a tip calculation based on 10, 20, 30. There's 10, there's 20, there's 30. But I didn't have my amount variable set correct. So it did the calculation based on 10, but it did that based on the random number. So this should work now. All right, there we go. 
$10, $20, $30, $40, $50, up to $90. And that gives the right result. So I could do that. Now, if I had things that I wanted to test, if I had specific values I wanted to test, but I did not, uh, they were not like uh, in a pattern like this. This is an obvious pattern, 10, 20, 30, 40. But let's say I wanted to test the five most common bills at a restaurant. You know, I don't know, 10, 25, 50, 100, and 200, let's say. Where there's no rhyme or reason to that. There's just, there's a set of numbers I want to test, but they can't be generated by a pattern. What would I do then? Make an array, all right? So I could say double... And then I could put in 10, 25, 50, 100, 150, 175, or something like that. All right? What I could do then is I could say, I have to go turn this back. We will do that in a minute. And we could say costs sub i. Because remember, an array is a list of values. And to refer to a element of the array, you have to say the array and the index of it. The index starts with 0. So it would be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. And as was observed, we can make this a better code by making this to say cost.length. Stand corrected. And now when I run this, it's going to run through my array and test those. So these are all tips that you can do to do that. The idea is, is that this unit test should thoroughly test my business logic um, objects or classes. And again, what does thoroughly test mean? It depends on the specific problem that you're dealing with. All right, we're going to shift gears here. All right, and we're going to add to it the notion of the quality of service. All right, because obviously you're not always going to tip 10% or 15%. Um, and we're going to base on the assumption that if the, the, the service is substandard, you're going to tip 10%, if it's average, 15%, if it's excellent, you're going to tip 20%. All right? So, how could we fix that? We're going to, exactly. Now, this guy here needs more information to do the job. I have a $100 meal, what's my tip? Well, how good was the service? You have to give everything. We want this to be self-contained. We want it to get, get everything it needs to do its job. So I'm going to make another. Yeah, we'll make it an int. And we'll call it arg service. And simply because everything starts numbering with zeros, we'll continue that. And I will say if our service equals zero. Then it's ten percent.
otherwise arg service equals one if arg service equals two. Now there could be as many parameters as needed for the particular application. We'll probably stop here because face it, tips aren't terribly exciting. All right. But we could extend this. Like for example, delivery you're going to tip different than if you dined in a pizza place, let's say. Or um, you know, sometimes parties of more than 10, they, they suggest adding a certain amount to the tip. So we could add all sorts of parameters here to make the complicate, uh, to, to complicate the, the parameters. But I think this is good enough for now. All right. To review, this is an if statement. This gets evaluated into a Boolean. And a Boolean is either true or false. All right. That's what we mean by a, bo a Boolean. There's only two alternatives. It can be true or it can be false. The two equal signs indicate a comparison. That's one thing that trips people up. But the nice thing is, if you've all done C sharp, this isn't like the days when I had Visual Basic students in class and they were used to using one equal sign for comparison. Two equal signs means a comparison. So what I'm doing effectively is I'm asking the question, does arg service equal zero? That's what you should read when you see arg service two equal signs zero. If it's true, we're going to do this block of statements. And in this case, there's only one statement in the block. Likewise this, likewise this. All right, I'm going to compile it and I'm going to get a couple errors. All right. Um, and I want to talk about those errors. I forgot to save it again. Or I'm so good that I cannot even intentionally make errors. One of the two. There we go. All right. This actually is fairly self-explanatory. It says method calc in class tip, tip calculator cannot be applied to given types. Required double int and found is double. In other words, we've changed this function to accept two arguments. Right now we are only giving it one argument. All right. So therefore we need to give it a second argument. So I'll do, I can just hard code one for now. We can test average, um, average um, level of, um, of service. We get another one that's a little puzzling. And it says variable answer might not have been initialized. If we look at this, we define an answer here, all right? We set the answer if this is true, we set the answer if this is true, we set the answer if this is true. The compiler doesn't realize that it's going to be one of those three things. It envisions a scenario where we made it all the way through that if statement and have not given answer a value. And therefore, we cannot return it if, if there's no value in it. It's not going to work well. So therefore, we have to initialize it. And probably the safest thing to do would be to initialize it at 0. So now when we compile it, everything should be OK. And if I run it, it does the calculation and it produces the results that it did before. All right, because um, I've hard coded in that there was average service. What if I want to take this and change it so that I pass? How can I change this to test all three levels of service? Okay, that's two good answers. 
A switch, yeah, that, yeah. Well, it depends. Keep in mind, I can't really test this. So I better have test cases of all three of those. All right? So I could do this a couple different ways, is the bottom line. One way I could do it would be to create a second array. And I could test $50 at average service, $50 at good uh, normal service, $50 at exceptional service. I could do that. Another thing I could do is I could wrap this code in another loop and, and run another variable, one, two, and three. So the first time in this loop, I test um, for $10 for all three of the uh, levels of service. Then I go for $25 for all three levels of service and all that. Or I could cheat and do this, all right? And I'm doing this for a purpose. Here's where we're going to spend a lot of time discussing how this kind of issue isn't worth a lot of time to spend worrying about. This is just test code, right? It doesn't have to be perfect. So while a regular class, I would hate to see me duplicate three loops like this. And the first time of the loop, give it a zero. The second time of the loop, give it a one. The third time of the loop, give it a two. It's just test code. That's not the best way to do it. Every way that people mention is a more, probably a more efficient way of doing it than this. But again, this is just our unit test code, so we don't need to sweat the details as much in this particular kind of class. Okay? So now when I run this, All right, there we see, we scroll up, there's the average service, up here is the poor service, and then the excellent service. And we can verify it's correct. I guess what I'm saying is spend time where you get bang for your buck, as they say. This class here, our business logic class, it would be eventually integrated into our application. We want to make that code as good as possible. All right. So therefore, we want to spend some time making sure that it works. All right. On the other hand, something like the test block of code, that's kind of throwaway code. So test thoroughly, but if you don't do it the absolute perfect way, that's probably okay. All right. Okay. I'm going to take these two files and I'm going to copy them into a folder and I'm going to call it version one. And then we're going to make version two. copy the two Java files in there, and I didn't copy them, I moved them. So I'll copy them back on the desktop. All right. Our first example here, my class had only one thing, it had a method, one single method. Classes can actually have two different kinds of things in them. can have something besides a method. And, th and they're called properties. 
All right. Or attributes or instance variables. Depending on the context, all of those three things can say the same thing. All right. Properties are characteristics. Um, methods are some sort of process. All right. So if we were to think of something, if we were to think of a student class, a name is an attribute, right? Every one of you is students, you have a name. That's a characteristic of you. Your address is a characteristic of you. What your student ID number is a characteristic of you. The process of enrolling in a class, though, involves some work and involves some process. So if a student has an enroll in class method, there's some stuff that has to be done, right? It's not simply a characteristic, that's a process. So for example, if a student try, if there's a, a method for a student to enroll in a class, first you look to see if the student had any of the prerequisites, you know, or had all of the prerequisites. All right. If they didn't, you'd check to see are they, um, did the faculty person um, bypass prerequisites for that? Then you look to see if the class is filled or not, all right, and so on. So there's a process for a student to enroll in a class, all right, a process that can be done, as opposed to your name, which is simply a value, a name, an address, a student number. Classes have attributes and methods, properties and functions, all right? This particular class in this example has a function that accepts two arguments, the cost of the meal and the level of service. We could do a slightly different approach here, and we could make those as attributes of the class and then create a method to calculate tip. All right? Which is better? Six of one, half does the other. You'd have to know more about our eventual plans of what all we wanted to do with this tip object and how long it needed to be around and so on. So let's go in here and let's edit this. No, I don't want to edit that. I want to edit this one. I'm going to edit this, and I'm going to create some attributes. How do I create the attributes? They go between the declaration of the class and the methods. So I've made two attributes for this class, a cost and a service. In other words, for this particular meal, this meal has two characteristics. It has a cost, it has a level of service associated with it. I can then ask to do a process, that is calculate the tip based on the rules that I've laid out here. Now notice I made those private, all right? In general, and again, you can find an exception for almost anything, but for the most part, attributes are to be either private or protected. And we'll talk about protected later. For now, you should make your attributes private. What does that mean when I say the attributes are private? That means the outside world can't get to those attributes directly. I think I gave the example about plugging in a set of headphones to the hardware. How you wouldn't want to have the user strip the wires on the headphones, crack open the case, find the different points on the sound card, and solder the headphones in, right? Why don't you want to do that besides being really difficult? Well, there's a good chance you're going to mess something up. All right, and 
somehow destroy the innards of your computer by changing something that you don't want to change. Think of the attributes as sort of the inner workings of a class. We want to control very tightly the manner at which those are accessed and manipulated. So we just don't want any other class to go in and set these values because we might at some point, not today, but at some point, put some validation on these, right? So for example, cost has to be greater than zero, right? You know, you couldn't go into a tip calculator and put in negative $100 and then try to collect $15 from the waitress, right? Because there's a negative $15 tip, all right? Likewise, the way this is defined, the level of service has to be zero, one, or two. Well, what happens if we give a level of service of 38? Well, the, the class isn't going to know what to do and it's not going to give you good results. So, we want tight control over how these attributes get set. All right? Therefore, we are going to write a method to do that. And right now, we're not going to do any of those validations, but we're positioning ourselves so that later on we can do validations to make sure that you don't try to put an illegal value in. If I were to make these attributes public, then any other class would be able to access them and mess them up. All right? So for each attribute, I'm going to create two methods, a setter and a getter an accessor and a mutator, thank you, all right? We're going to have a method that will let us set the value and a method that will allow us to get the value. So, I'm going to go in here, I'm going to say public void set cost. What does it do? Well, it accepts an argument that's a double. And what does that method do? It takes the argument and stuffs it into the cost variable. Now again, this might not look very valuable, but when we start talking about being able to put validation on it and controlling it and things like that, is valuable for us to make the attributes private. This concept is known as data hiding. All right? You don't want the outside world to know what's going on in the innards of your class. All right? Our get method is going to do the opposite. It's going to return a double. No arguments. And it's going to return cost. We do the same thing for service. These are known as getters and setters. Thank you. These are sort of the simplest form of it, which is a good place to start. All, right. All it does is it takes the value that, the func that is given and stores it in there for later use. All right. Now, I'm going to change this function, right? Because this function doesn't need the arguments anymore. This function, this class already has those attributes, so we might as well use those. So, I'll remove the calc there. And I'll change these to refer to the attributes.
All right. So I call this calc function. It's not going to expect any arguments because we've already set those values. And what if we didn't set those values? Well, again, later on in the semester, we'll look at putting validation in there. So if you call that method and you haven't yet set the value, it'll blow up with you, uh, blow up uh, for you. And it'll blow, but it will blow up in a graceful way. It won't just simply. Yeah, we'll throw an exception, exactly. Um, so we made that change. Now we have to change the other one. And the other one, all we have to do is we have to call the set methods prior to prior to calling that calc function. And we remove the arguments from the calc function. And remember, I'm not... Would it be better to put what outside the loop? No, I want, I want to set the cost each time through the loop. Right. I could probably put the set service outside of the loop, but Save it. And it gives us effectively the same results. Now sometimes you have a choice when you do this. Um, I think for your lab assignment I say to have attributes and have set and get methods so you should do it this way. So again, you know, at other times, the idea is, is um, the, the question becomes, do I want to make something an attribute or do I want to simply pass it in as the argument? I guess I would say that if I want to keep that value around for a while, I'm going to make it an attribute. Where if it's just something transitory that I don't really need to remember, then I'll make it an argument. All right. We do an automobile example, at least we have in the past. I don't know if we'll do it this term or not, but we've done an automobile example where um, we, we keep track of like the kind of car it is, what miles per gallon it gets. That kind of thing is persistent. I mean, that's going to be true for a car, for a particular car, that it has a certain miles per gallon that it typically gets. But the price of, of, of gasoline, that's not really an attribute of the car, right? That's just something that the car might need to know you need to tell the car how much a gallon of gas costs so you can calculate how much it's going to cost to fill it up. But that's not really a characteristic of the car. Whereas in a case like this, I would say that if this were a bill object for a meal or a tip object for a meal or a meal object, however you call it, the cost of the meal and the level of service is an attribute. That's a characteristic of that transaction. And therefore, it probably makes sense to make it an um, attribute instead of um, making, uh, making uh, arguments to the function. Now, the other thing that this does, by the way, is how many tip classes are created? Just the one, because that's prior to the loop. We could actually move this code in the loop. And we could actually create an array of tip objects. And that would be if we needed to look at all of them at the same time. All right. In this case, we're simply doing our calculation, outputting the result, and so on. Again, keep in mind that the point of this code is simply to unit test our application. It doesn't have to be the most efficient, the smartest, the perfect code. It just has to thoroughly test it. So again, does this thoroughly test it? Yeah. I would say it does a reasonably job test it because we're testing all of the 
levels of service, 0, 1, and 2. We're testing them for a range of reasonable values. Now, as we add to our class, if we we're going to add like number of people at the dinner or whatever, as we add to the class, we might have to add test cases, right? You know, if for parties, for big parties, parties over 10, maybe there's a surcharge on top of the tip. Well, then you'd have to go in and add that functionality. Or as we add error checking, for example, we'd have to verify that, yeah, that error checking works when I go and try to um, run this and say that, you know, the bill was negative $50 for dinner or something like that. But again, we're getting ahead of ourselves there. Questions about any of this? All right, we'll see you up in lamb.